Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is truly our first um, virtual course series webinar. Um, usually our team is huddled, huddled in our Painesville headquarters um, doing the webinar, but due to um, social distancing, we are all working remotely. So um, we'll be starting off right now with the first truly virtual course series webinar. So welcome to the uh, course series portfolio webinar. Uh, understanding the second step of the adhesive selection process, which we call the importance of knowing the surface energy of the substrate. I am Jim Brzeitis, the Marketing Communications Manager for Performance Safety North America, and I'll be your moderator today. For clarity, the audio lines will be muted during the call. Uh, to submit a question, you can use the chat tool located on your screen. Time permitting, all questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. If your question is not answered during the event, we will contact you directly to provide an answer. When you registered, you should have received a digital copy of the Core Series product selection tool. It would be beneficial to have a printed copy of the file handy or the file you received when you registered open for reference during the presentation. In the future, if you like a hard copy of the tool, please contact your Avery Denison account manager. Today's presenters, we like to call them the king and queen of the core series, are Scott Krasinski, application engineer, and general industrial product manager, Deanne Lewis. My time for the intro is now done, and I will hand it over to Deanne. Thanks, Jim. And thank all of you for taking time out of your day to join us for the second webinar in the series, Step 2 Surface Energy. Hopefully by now, everyone has been working with the Core Series tool and is finding the program easy to use. The Core Series tool is designed to educate your organization on the key informational needs that are required to quote your customer quickly and effectively. Next, Jim. Thank you. This guide is meant to streamline the adhesive selection process by answering four key questions. Now it's time to open your hard copy of the selection tool, or if you did not receive a hard copy, as Jim had mentioned, you should have received it with the digital registration process. So we'll pause for a moment so everyone can locate their course series tool, as it will be helpful to help you through the process um, throughout the presentation. Jim, could you proceed yeah. to the next slide, please? Thank you. Sure. Yeah. All right. Just a quick overview. Um, the Core Series tool has been designed to walk you through the tape selection process. Step one is understanding what we'll be laminating to. Step two is understanding the surface energy. Step three is considering the end use requirements. And step four is choosing the construction and liner combination that will be the most friendly for the manufacturing process and in the application. Next, please, Jim. So now if you would turn to page 13 and 14 of your guide, you'll see the same thing that's on the screen. Hopefully by now, this is familiar to most of you. But for the few folks that are on the phone that may have not been through this, I want to just quickly walk you through how you choose a core series product. As you can see, the color coding of the adhesive family follows all the way throughout the selection tool. On page 13, we have all the general purpose adhesive families, which provide a transfer tape and a double coated option for each family followed by the liner option for each construction. In addition, we provide the ordering information, information such as the spec number, the MOQ, which is one mold, the width, and the minimum length of the product. 
And, of course, all these are four-day lead time products. In addition, we provide the product thickness of each product, breaking it down by the unwind side, the carrier, the liner side, the liner, and providing you the total thickness of the product with and without the liner. Please also note that the products marked with two asterisks are produced in full adhesive width only due to the aggressive nature of the adhesive. Products that are marked in blue are approved under Title 21 for indirect food contact. And lastly, our HPA 1902 and 1905 are you all recognized. On page four, you'll see the specialty products, which include the differential adhesive, and then also our double-coated foams, single-coated foils, and our flocks. This page is organized in the same exact fashion as page 13. That is it on this. Any other questions? We'll move right on. So now I'm going to hand it over to Scott, who can talk you through uh, what your sub what substrate is your die cut cut bonding to? Stop. Thanks, Deanne. Thanks everybody for joining us. Um, so uh, this is the technical related uh, aspect of uh, the presentation today. And um, as a review, real quick, uh, last time we uh, met for the webinar, we discussed step one, which is uh, what material are you laminating to? Um, and assuming it's a double-sided tape and you've laminated to a material, um, now we're thinking about step two. Um, what substrate is your die-cut part going to bond to? And we're going to dive into a few different things. Um, we're going to talk about the common substrates that your customers are bonding to. We're going to talk about surface energy and, and what it's defined as and what materials might be different surface energies. We'll talk about how we uh, test for adhesion. And we'll talk about some examples and give you some tips about some other stuff here today. So, okay. Um, so if, again, if you have that product selection tool out, it's helpful to have it out in front of you as you're listening along. Um, you've worked your way through the document, and now we're on step two. And you know, we're really primarily focused on surface energy when it, um, it comes to substrate. You really need to know what type of substrate you're bonding to. Um, in order to really categorize or define what type of surface energy you're working with to make sure the adhesive you're selecting will work for the application. Um, and uh, the way we've divided the core series up in terms of surface energy are, uh, it's pretty simple, high, medium, low, and extra low. Um, and we'll define what that means here in a second. So as you move along in the selection tool, you'll see a handy dandy chart right here. It's the surface energy selection guide. And how it works is it matches up what particular adhesive types within the core series would work for what type of surface energies. So the first column there is your adhesive types. And again, it's color coded. So as you're following along selecting the adhesive, you can follow the color. Uh, for example, general purpose rubber right there is orange and you'd be able to follow that throughout. Um, and then we have all the other adhesive types uh, listed here. The uh, columns to the right of the adhesive types uh, column are the different surface energies we have categorized here. So first you have high surface energy, and those common materials would consist of aluminum, stainless steel, and copper. Um, metals are high surface energy materials. And um, you need to be careful thinking about metal, though. You need to make sure it's a clean metal and not some type of coated metal or painted metal. Because um, if that were the case, you wouldn't actually be bonding to the metal. You'd be bonding to something else. You'd be bonding to the coating. Um, we also have glass. And then we have a few plastics that fit within the high surface energy um, category. As we move towards the medium surface energy category, you'll see we have other plastics like ABS and uh, polycarbonate. And we continue moving over to the low surface energy category. This would include things like polypropylene or powder coated paints. And then um, this is kind of unique in the, the tape world is actually listing an extra low surface energy category. Um, PTFE, also known as Teflon, is very low surface energy and so is silicone. And the way this chart works is that if you see a circle that has been completely filled in, that means we would recommend that tape 
for that particular surface energy in that material. Um, if it's halfway filled in, it's probably still good enough. And if it's empty, um, we would not recommend it and would not avoid, or we would not, you should avoid uh, using that adhesive with that type of substrate. So just as a few examples here, um, high surface energy is easy to bond to, and I'll explain why that is soon. Um, but every tape uh, and adhesive within the core series portfolio will bond fine or perfectly well to high surface energy. Once we get into medium surface energy, you'll see some performance dropping off, but for the most part, the adhesive in the core series will work great for that. And it's when we get to the low surface energy category, you need to be careful. Um, the high, surf, high shear acrylic and the high performance acrylic, while great adhesives are not very tacky, aggressive adhesives that would be able to bond well to low surface energy, so you would avoid those. Okay, and I think Dan had um, sent out a survey and would like to bring up what we uh, asked for there. Yep, thanks, Scott. So during the registration process, we asked uh, what are the top three most common substrates your customers are bonding to? And listed on the screen, number one, powder-coated paint, number two, polypropylene, and number three, AVS. So Scott, can you comment um, to each of these surfaces what type of surface yep. energy each of these surfaces are, and what type of applications they're typically used in, please. Yes, absolutely. So not surprised to see the uh, materials in this list. I, I come across these materials every day when I'm working on applications with customers. Uh, the first one I'll talk about is ABS. Uh, that is a plastic material, and it's, it's medium surface energy, so it's, it's fairly easy to bond to. It's a very uh, rigid, strong plastic that is used extensively in automotive and appliances, uh, electronic devices, and um, other type of molded part assemblies. Then you have polypropylene, which uh, is used in similar applications to ABS. However, it, it's less expensive, and it's more of a flexible plastic. Um, this particular plastic, you could actually um, press your fingernail into it and make an indent a little bit. Um, and what's um, challenging about polypropylene, uh, as you may have seen in the previous slides, is that it's a low surface energy plastic. It's a very common plastic, so um, we, we commonly have to account for recommending adhesives that bond to it. And then the, the first one there, which I'm surprised was number one, uh, was powder coated paints. Um, powder coated paints are used on metals. And the thing about powder-coated paints to know is that they actually can vary in surface energies. Um, you can have a high surface energy powder-coated paint, um, but primarily the ones we come across are um, going to be low surface energy, and they can be a little challenging to bond to. Um, they even have a little bit of texture in them, um, so that, that can be a challenge to bond to. Um, but, the, you know, the particular applications that powder-coated paints are, are going to be used are whenever, wherever metal is being used. So, um, you know, cars and, um, and heavy equipment, industrial equipment, um, they often have a powder coating um, to them um, for color aesthetics, but then also to help um, with like rust prevention. Okay, back over to me. Okay. So we also asked what are the top three new substrates that your customers are bonding to. And the results were number one, powder coated aluminum, number two, TPO, TPE plastics, number three, Santa Prime and EPDM blended polypropylene. The reason we asked this question is we are wanting to always be on the forefront of the new materials our customers are bonding or laminating to. It provides us the opportunity to assess our core series portfolio so we can confirm that we have the right products to meet our customers' needs or if we need to make adjustments to the portfolio. The portfolio is intended to adapt on a regular basis to cover the new materials that are being introduced into the market. So with that being said, Scott, can you please comment on each of these surfaces as well? Yep, yeah, and I would agree with how the, uh, the customers responded to the survey. I, I've seen some of these materials popping up recently. Um, first, I'll start with uh, number three there. Uh, Santa Prine or EPDM, um, which is typically um, used in rubber components like rubber extrusions and stuff like that. 
Um, but ha I had found out that you can actually blend these types of rubber materials with plastics like polypropylene. Um, and specifically, the, the parts I had worked on with a few customers were an EPDM bl blended polypropylene. And it was an interesting looking uh, rigid molded part. Um, it looked like a typical uh, plastic part that goes in your car, um, except it also looked like rubber. And it had properties of both. You could flex it and bend it, um, but it also, the surface of it felt like a rubber. And um, if, many of you might not know, but r rigid rubber is very difficult to bond to. Um, sometimes it's even more difficult to bond to than low surface energy plastic. Um, in this case, it had a, it had a balanced um, surface energy between the two of them. And we screened several different tapes to this particular uh, substrate material and found that our FT3043 or the FT1943 PP, uh, which uses our LSD modified acrylic, did a fine job of bonding to it. Um, but some of the other tapes that we uh, typically recommend for low surface energy did not perform as well. So uh, we had to be careful with things like that. And as Deanne mentioned, you know, we'll be adding materials and substrates to the core series. If it's something you don't see on the core series, that's where you would want to ask our customer service, our technical service team um, to get you the best recommendation. Uh, next, we got TPO or TPE plastics. Um, yeah, TPO uh, is a low surface energy plastic and it can range uh, a bit in how it uh, is in terms of flexibility. You can have a very rigid, stiff TPO or you can have a very flexi, flexible uh, TPO. Um, for example, the, the pillars in your car on the interior there are, are often made of TPO. And the ones that are more flexible, um, you need to watch out for because they can have plasticizer in them. And plasticizer is um, this migratory component uh, material that's added to these types of plastics that makes them more flexible. And uh, that can be bad for adhesives because these migratory components can migrate into the adhesive and break down the adhesive. So in that situation, because they're low surface energy and they have plasticizer, we would recommend something like our general purpose acrylic, which is a modified acrylic that can bond to low surface energy materials, but then also resist the plasticizers that might creep in there. Um, a rubber adhesive would bond well to a flexible TPO at first, um, but you might notice after a week or so um, that the part may have fallen off and that the adhesive basically turns to a really weak, fragile goo. Um, that plasticizer can vary quite a bit, so we have to be mindful of that type of thing. And then number one here, um, powder-coated aluminum. Um, I would throw this in the powder-coated paint uh, arena with what I had just described in the previous slide. I'm surprised to see that it's uh, a newer substrate that our customers are encountering quite a bit, um, but you know, maybe um, it's being used with aluminum on some applications you're seeing a lot lately. Okay, so now we're going to get into a little bit of the science of uh, how pressure sensitive adhesives work and specifically how to uh, PSA, whenever you see PSA, by the way, it's pressure sensitive adhesive, um, just an acronym there. How do they stick? So there's several theories and a lot of um, science and, and reasons behind it, but there's two primary reasons of why pressure sensitive adhesives will stick. That's the rheology of the adhesive and the surface energetics of the adhesive combined with the surface energy of the substrate. We're going to discuss surface energy in the next slide here, but um, you know, the rheology uh, is the study of the deformation or flow of materials that are both elastic and viscous. Okay, so an easy way to describe this is that uh, adhesives are viscoelastic materials, meaning they have liquid-like and solid-like properties to them. Um, I like to compare them to silly putty Everybody knows silly putty because you, you grew up with it and played with it. You can form it in a ball and you can bounce it off the wall or the ground and it acts like a solid. But if you slowly pull it apart, you'll notice that it will flow and, and kind of stretch out. Um, adhesives are very much like that. And when you're bonding to a part, um, adhesives will want to flow uh, a little more into the substrate uh, to make a really good intimate contact, okay? Now, if you combine that with the surface energetics between the adhesive and the substrate, uh, these are intermolecular forces, um, things like van der Waals attraction, chemical bonding. Um, you want both of those uh, elements to be maximized as much as possible. 
okay, um, for the best bond. Adhesive manufacturers and tape manufacturers uh, have way more control over the rheology of the adhesives they formulate as opposed to the surface energetics of the adhesives they're working with. So uh, you'll learn later why uh, rheology kind of saves the day for bonding to different types of surface energies. Okay, so what actually is surface energy? You know, we, we talk about different substrates and how they have different surface energies. Uh, surface energy is a, is a, is a measurement um, of uh, how it's affecting the adhesive to wet out. Um, there's actually a quantifiable way to measure it um, with dyne pens or with droplets and measuring the contact angle with it. And the units you might see around the internet are called dynes. Sometimes they're used as a dyne per length. Um, but in terms of the core series, we've categorized it to make it easy for everybody. So it's impacting the ability of an adhesive to wet out over the surface of a material. Low surface energies minimize that wet out, and they're more, they're more difficult to bond to, as you've been seeing. And high surface energies are the opposite. They have excellent wet out properties and provide the best adhesion. So um, as you've seen in the charts too, rubber adhesives generally offer better adhesion to low surface energy substrates because they're softer and they flow more. Um, but when it comes to acrylics, which are generally firmer adhesives, they don't flow as much, meaning they mo need more time to dwell and flow out over the substrate. And sometimes they're just too firm to bond to uh, different types of low surface energy materials and you won't get a good bond, as I'll show you some examples of that soon. And sometimes the combination um, that you're working with, uh, the solution cannot be solved in the way you want it to be. So um, there's some ways out of that by um, providing some special treatments to the substrate, such as corona treatment, primers, or top, co uh, top coatings. Now, going back to our common substrates and the, the categories that we have to us, again, in high surface energy, you're usually looking at metals and metals that are not coated, uh, glass, nylon, and um, to the right, you have your low surface energy materials, which are typically plastics. The most common ones are going to be polyethylene, polypropylene, and as you guys had surveyed, the survey had indicated, uh, powder coated paints. Uh, we have droplets here uh, as a visualization of what's occurring. And one example I really like to give for surface energy is um, for those of you who have actually waxed their car before. Um, if you've noticed, after you take off the wax and you wash it again and you apply water to it, uh, the water really beads up on that car. Um, that's because the wax you applied to that uh, car uh, actually pretty much lowered the surface energy of the, the car siding there, and that's why you get that nice bead like that. Okay, the same story on a microscopic level is going on with adhesives and these different types of plastics that you're working with. Okay, I mentioned that rheology can save the day when it comes to surface energy. So, generally speaking, the softer the adhesive or the higher the flow of the adhesive, uh, the, the better it is for bonding to low surface energy because it can really flow out and make really good intimate contact to maximize the amount of surface energetic and attraction between the two. They get a good bond. And the way this chart works here um, is the softer adhesives are listed to the top and the firmer adhesives are listed to the bottom. And for the most part, a lot of these adhesives that we have in the core series are more of the, the, the softer variety that are able to bond to the low surface energy materials, as you've seen with that chart. Um, but we do have some firmer adhesives like high shear acrylic and high performance acrylic um, that uh, are lower flow and do not bond well to low surface energy. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, why would a high performance acrylic be listed as a high performance acrylic if it can't bond to low surface energy? Well, there's a balance that's occurring here between um, being able to stick to a substrate versus being able to stay stuck and resist um, shear uh, loads and temperatures, okay? So, for example, a high-performance acrylic, while it can't bond well to low surface energy material, is excellent for resisting high temperatures and um, being able to hold on to some really heavy loads by having excellent shear resistance. And for the next webinar, we're actually going to be learning about 
more about the end use requirements around temperature resistance and what type of shear resistance you need. Um, so in general, we're always trying to find that balance of what's going to stick and what's going to stay stuck. And that's reflected here in the rheology. Uh, a lot of the rheology uh, in terms of surface energy, softer is better. But if you need a more resilient adhesive, the firmer the better. So um, it's all about finding that balance. Okay, uh, now you get a look inside of how we test for adhesion. Um, and the most common way of testing is called the peel adhesion test. This is a standardized, standardized test uh, among ASTM, uh, ISO, PSCC, which is the Pressure Sensitive Tape Council. And there's a very specific way to test these, um, but there's a lot of different factors and variables that you can adjust um, to yield uh, a better understanding of the adhesive's interaction with these different substrates. First of all, in that picture, uh, the larger picture, you'll see those um, clamps that are grabbing onto the tape and the substrate at the bottom there and pulling it apart. Um, these machines will pull apart uh, the tape and the substrate at a certain speed, which is 12 inches per minute. Uh, we can do different angles. Uh, as shown there, that's 180 degrees. The other common uh, angle that we remove at is 90 degrees. Um, we can put different substrate panels in there. And um, what's great about our, our lab is that we have a wide variety of substrate panels readily available for testing. Um, but also oftentimes we have customers send us in actual parts that they're bonding to. And our technicians complain because they have to cut them up and, and form them in a certain way so that we can test the flat sections there to get a good reading of how the adhesion goes. Uh, we typically test at one inch wide. Um, and then we also use a two mil polyester film as a support uh, for double-sided tapes, um, like a transfer tape or a double-coated tape. We can also uh, use the material you've laminated to as the support material to test with, um, as it can yield slightly different results. The other variables we can affect are the dwell time. Um, we can uh, apply it right away and test it right away, which would be an initial dwell time, or we can let it age for, say, 72 hours or three days uh, and see how the dwell time affects the bond strength. In addition, we can do uh, different types of conditions beforehand. We could put it in a high temperature aging condition, like an oven at um, 200 degrees Fahrenheit. We can put it in low temperature scenarios, or we can actually cycle it. Um, and you can imagine with all the different adhesives we have, the different substrates we have, and the different conditions, we do a lot of different testing. Um, and we have a lot of different data available to us to, to, give us the to give you guys the best recommendation on what tape to use. Okay, similar to peel testing um, to measure adhesion, and this is primarily around the initial adhesion or the tack, is called loop tack testing. All right, so in, in this setup, we're using the same Instron machine, except now we have a, uh, a substrate at the bottom and uh, we've laminated tape to a two mil polyester film. And we loop the tape as shown in the picture with the adhesive exposed on the outside. And initially the tape, it, it starts so that the tape is not in contact with the substrate. And the loop goes down and makes contact with the substrate briefly and it pulls away um, at a certain speed. Um, there's really no pressure being applied except for the internal rigidity of the polyester film and the tape. Um, as the instron or the, the claw comes down uh, to make contact with that substrate. And then we pull away and we read the force. And this really gives us a good understanding of what the initial adhesion might be like when your, um, your customer is probably applying a die cut part to their assembly. All right, um, so now we're going to go through an adhesion comparison. And, and don't get too worried about all the data points here. I know it's a little overwhelming. We're going to break it down in the next slides here. Um, so broadly speaking here, we have two different uh, test setups. We have aluminum uh, testing on the, the left side, and we have polypropylene testing on the right side, as noted by the acronyms there, AL is aluminum, PP is polypropylene. Um, we're doing 180 degree peel adhesions. And the, uh, the force that we're reading out in is in pounds per inch width. Okay, so again, we've tested with an inch wide strip of tape, and the force that we're reading out is in pounds. 
Then we're doing different dwell conditions within those different substrates. So we have initial dwell, a four-hour dwell, a 24-hour dwell, and a 72-hour dwell. And then we're testing four different tapes, okay? We're testing the FBR 1950, which is in blue. That's our general purpose rubber. We have the FT2018X, which is the red. That is the low VOC acrylic. We have the green, which is the HBA 1902. Um, that is our high performance acrylic. And then we have the purple, which is the FT1123, uh, known as the general purpose acrylic. So these particular four tapes are similar in construction as in they're all transfer tapes and the caliper of them only varies between two and three mil. So we're kind of just evaluating the chemistry and how they uh, bond to different substrates at different dwell times, okay? So go to the next slide here. Let's just con compare tape versus tape and let's just fix it in on one particular condition, and that would be the polypropylene for an initial dwell time, as what's um, boxed in right there, okay? So first, uh, FBR 1950, which is a general purpose rubber, that's getting a pretty good uh, force readout of uh, four pounds per inch. Uh, that's a pretty good initial dwell time uh, peel value. Um, that would be acceptable. Let's move next to the acrylic, um, which is generally considered a firmer adhesive on the FT2018X, the red one, that's getting over two pounds, um, which is okay. Uh, it's decent for an initial dwell time. Then we look at HPA1902, and you can see there, oh, that's um, around half a pound of adhesion. That's bad. Um, you would want to avoid that, um, and it's probably not going to improve when you see something like that that low. Um, then if we move over to the general purpose acrylic, that's getting about three and a half pounds per inch, and that's pretty good there too. So you know, you can compare a rubber adhesive against three different uh, acrylic uh, adhesives. And um, for us to be able to add different types of tackifiers and, and cross linkers to those acrylic adhesives would give them different properties. And that results in different peel values to, to polypropylene in an initial dwell condition. Okay, next we're just gonna compare how adhesives do on different surface energies, okay? So we're gonna compare each adhesive within the 24 hour dwell time uh, to the different substrates. So let's focus on the blue here first, okay? So first you have FBR 1950, which again is the general purpose rubber. It's getting around eight pounds of adhesion on aluminum. And then it does pretty good on polypropylene there at six and a half to seven pounds of adhesion. So you can see that rubber is generally less affected by surface energy and how it's gonna perform in peel adhesion testing. Let's take a look at the red one now. That's FT2018X, or the low VOC acrylic. Here it's doing great on aluminum. It's over seven pounds. But now the adhesion is really dropping off on polypropylene. It's only over two pounds, okay? Um, so you would wanna watch out for this particular adhesive on low surface energy. Um, and you'll notice though, even after two days, uh, and then the next column there, 72 hours, that particular adhesive does dwell up. So it, it, it's still acceptable for most applications with polypropylene. Um, but it's going to get that half circle in our chart, and you're going to have to be a little concerned about it and maybe do a little more testing or understanding around it. Then we have our HPA 1902, um, which is getting around three pounds of adhesion to aluminum, um, which is generally a lower adhesion type of product. As you know, it's a firmer, high shear product. Um, but compare that to polypropylene, ooh, again, yeah, it's not even dwelling better on polypropylene at all. Completely not going to work there. Um, and let's compare FT 1123, which is our general purpose acrylic, very high adhesion on both substrates, um, so less affected by surface energy. Okay, and then the last thing to consider throughout this um, adhesion comparison is how the dwell times affect the adhesion, okay? So let's look at FBR 1950, uh, the blue one, our general purpose rubber on aluminum. You can see it's uh, getting about six pounds initially on aluminum. It dwells up by another pound after four hours and then even another pound uh, at 24 hours. Now a rubber adhesive um, generally maxi maximizes its adhesion after 24 hours. If you compare that to 
uh, an acrylic, which usually takes 72 hours. So look at FT2018X there. Um, a lower adhesion at first to aluminum, around two and a half pounds, but then it surely dwells up um, to four pounds at four hours, around seven pounds after 24 hours, and then it, it seems to be maximizing itself out around eight pounds at 72 hours. Now let's compare how that might be doing for HPA, uh, the green one on polypropylene. You can see even there with low surface energy, um, that product's not dwelling up. It's just not going to work for polypropylene. I keep beating up on HPA. It shouldn't be so hard on it. You guys are going to see how excellent HPA is in, in the next uh, webinar here. Um, but look at FD1123 on polypropylene. It's getting just under four pounds of adhesion initially, but it dwells all the way up to uh, seven pounds, and it kind of levels off after 24 hours. Um, that adhesive performs a little bit more like a rubber adhesive in terms of adhesion, um, but you're going to see how its, it's shear and temperature resistance are, are, a little, are a lot better than what um, a general purpose rubber can do. Okay, um, we'll take you through some quick examples using the core series guide. Uh, we're going to go through aluminum, polypropylene, and PTFE. All right, this is an easy one. You guys have seen it, aluminum. Uh, it's the first one listed, and it's high surface energy. And look at that. Every tape is going to work, okay? Um, but, again, I want to reiterate that if you hear a customer saying that they're bonding to metal and it's aluminum or something like that, make sure, hey, is it, is it uncoated? There's no type of top coating or, or paint on there, right? It's, it's pure, uh, clean aluminum. Um, and in that case, it's going to be really easy to bond to. Okay, now we're uh, moving into the very popular uh, polypropylene, and again, it's low surface energy, okay? So you'll see here, again, our, our options are going to be limited, no high shear acrylic, no high performance acrylic that we would recommend. Some of the adhesives like uh, the uh, low VOC acrylic are going to do an okay job. Um, if they have a little more dwell time and they're in a flatter scenario with less weight, um, they'll, they'll totally be fine. General purpose rubber is going to be the most tackiest to it. Uh, we have our LSD modified acrylic that does a great job, the uh, low surface energy plastics as well. Um, one other thing that you want to consider with polypropylene um, is that oftentimes, uh, especially in automotive, um, manufacturers are going to load up the uh, plastic with fillers um, like talc or glass fiber. And you might see like polypropylene 30% talc or something like that. Um, those additives can, or fillers can affect the surface energy slightly. Um, but that being said, it would still fit within the low surface energy category and our recommendations would go unchanged. Okay, PTFV, um, which is also known as Teflon under the brand name um, from that popular manufacturer. Um, and some of you may have heard that nothing sticks to Teflon. Uh, that's mostly true. Um, we're not going to recommend any adhesives to bond to Teflon in the core series except for the silicone adhesive that's in our FT9302SF. Um, that particular product is a double-sided or double-coated tape. Uh, it's got that silicone adhesive on one side that could bond to a material like this. Um, if it's a film version of PTFE, you could laminate with it. If it's a more substrate-like situation where it's a rigid component part, um, the other side would have to be laminated. And the other side of the tape is a, uh, our general purpose acrylic, uh, which is good for binding to a lot of stuff there. So, Okay, um, we've got some tips to close out. Um, the first tip I have for you guys is to beware of surface contaminants. Um, I've mentioned it before with metal. Um, you know, you might have an oil or you might be selling to a customer that has a very dirty warehouse that has a lot of dust all over the place. Um, some of those things can be seen very easily. If, you're, if the die cut part's not bonding to it and you're seeing some type of con uh, contaminant on the surface, well, you're not bonding to the substrate. You're bonding to the contaminant, and it's affecting the bond. Um, but sometimes that contaminant is not always easy to see because there can be things like mold release agents uh, or mold release spray that the plastic part manufacturer uh, had been spraying in their mold cavity uh, when molding these parts. Um, and sometimes that can 
uh, flip over to the substrate and stay with the part. Um, you may have gotten uh, in scenarios before where maybe you've been selling to a customer the same application and same part for years, and all of a sudden they say, hey, our part's not working. Your part's not bonding to our part anymore. Uh, what's wrong with the adhesive? And you guys will come to us and ask, hey, what's wrong with the adhesive? And um, the first thing um, I do uh, is ask, actually, hey, did anything change with the customer's uh, situation? And a lot of times what we find with these mold release sprays is that um, the mold release operator had left the company and a new one had joined. And this new operator liked to use a heavy amount of, of mold release uh, spray on the mold, and it was transferring over to the plastic. Um, so we have to be aware of those types of things, and sometimes it's hard to see, and we have to troubleshoot it out. Okay, and the last tip here is to be aware of surface texture. Uh, we kind of mentioned this before on the lamination side in step one. If you're laminating to a very porous material, um, you have to be careful about what type of adhesive and what type of tape you select. Um, but the same idea can be applied to how a rigid substrate might work. If it's a textured uh, substrate, it can be harder to bond to. Um, I've worked with even a high surface energy uh, aluminum that happened to be very textured. Um, because it was so textured um, and we weren't working with the right adhesive, the bond was poor. Um, but if that particular adhesive was used with a regular, uh, nice, clean surface of aluminum, it would have been totally fine. Uh, so the way you need to counteract uh, working with uh, a heavy surface texture is um, you need to work with a tape that has a heavier adhesive mass. And that can mean anything from moving from a, a transfer tape that's 2 mils to a transfer tape that's 5 mils thick. So an example of that would be FT1123. That's only about 2.5 mils thick. FT1126 is 5 mils thick. And that might be enough of the difference to uh, get the bond you need. Um, also, a softer adhesive would work. Uh, the same story with surface energy, um, maximizing that bond because of the surface energy. Well, if you have a very textured surface, a softer adhesive will flow more and maximize more of the bond um, by being able to kind of flow into the nooks and crannies of that type of texture. Okay, um, we've reached the, uh, the summary here. Um, of step two, what is the surface energy of the substrate the laminated part will be bonding to? In step one, we talked about why it's important to know, for us to know, or for you to know, what type of adhesive to match up with what material you're laminating to. The same story applies to the end use substrate that your die cut part's bonding to. You gotta know what it is so you can find out what the surface energy is at the least. And um, you know, one of the things we do, um, if you don't know, especially if it's early in the quoting process and your customer has no idea what that surface is going to be, you assume it's low surface energy because low surface energies are more difficult for adhesives to bond to. Um, if it's high surface energy, anything in our portfolio here would work. Um, but with low surface energy, you need to be more selective with what you're, you're selecting here. Um, and that being said, the core series has plenty of options for low surface energy. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the best way to go about it is just to use our product selection tool and find a particular adhesive, uh, the substrate you're working with and match it up with the right adhesive. Um, and if it's something that's not popping up on the, the, the core series portfolio, don't be afraid to, to call up our customer service or ask our, our website. Uh, we'd be happy to get back to you and, and make a recommendation for you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Scott. Um, Hopefully everyone has found this session to be informative and maybe even developed a deeper understanding of surface energy and its importance in the tape selection process. Our next webinar on this series will be step three, understanding and user requirements. Our next session will be held on September 10th at two o'clock um, and we will send out the invites prior to the event. Um, as you can see on the slide here, if you do not have a hard copy of the product selection tool, you can order one by going to core.series at averydennison.com or calling your account manager or the application support line that's listed on the slide. 
And lastly, um, I wanted to thank everyone for joining us today for the session. We look forward to hosting you for the future sh sessions as well. Um, Scott, my contact information is listed on the slide above in the event that you have any additional questions. Um, it's my understanding that we got some very good questions um, on the uh, chat line. So I'm going to hand it over to Jim, and he's going to ask the questions. And once again, I thank you for joining us. Thank you, Deanne. Um, like Deanne said, we did get really great engagement, so we're going to go through here and um, ask these ones and see where Scott and Deanne could add to it. Uh, one question we have here is um, probably for Scott and Deanne both. How do we initiate testing with the lab for peel adhesion testing? Also, is there a cost involved in the testing? Yeah, so I'll take that one. So um, first of all, there is no cost involved with testing with us. Um, it's, it's a simple matter of um, reaching out to our customer service and um, discussing your application and what you'd like to do. And then um, we'd be happy to have our, our team of technicians uh, test material. A lot of times we'll have um, some data that's not uh, easily publicly available, but we can quickly share it with you. Um, we have a lot of substrates in-house already um, that we would be able to gather data for and share with you. Um, but otherwise, yes, we do do specific application testing. Maybe you have a new type of uh, substrate material and you have some parts for us. You can send it in to us and we, we would be happy to test it. All right, thank you, Scott. Uh, another question from one of our attendees, and this uh, was going back to your comparison charts. Why does the FT2018X test weaker after four hours of dwell time on PC? Yeah, so um, one thing about that, uh, we can't go back to the graph right now really, but um, what happens there, um, in theory, it should improve, right? But as we know, with testing and how real data comes out, that's always not necessarily the case. There can be some variability um, that occurs, and the variability can happen from uh, the technician, the, the type of substrate we have. There could be something that's slightly different about the substrate. There could be something that's slightly different about the tape that we use. And there could be something slightly different about how the operator has set it up. Um, that being said, it as part of the standards that are available to us in ASTM and um, on PSTC, there is a level of acceptable variability. And um, I don't remember off the top of my head what it is right now, but um, what you saw on that chart was within the acceptable range of what could occur. Um, and, um, you know, when we talk uh, a four-hour difference, um, we need to just be mindful of the fact that those types of things can happen. Thank you, Scott. Uh, next question, does Avery Dennison carry any thermoplastic adhesives? Uh, I'm, I'm actually not entirely sure what they mean by that, Jim. I'll have to, uh, we'll have to get back to them. Okay. We, we have the information we can follow up. All right. Yep. Okay. Uh, next up here, this is a little longer one, so bear with me. Why do some PET coated tapes show a surface energy of 34 dyne when the raw PET should test between 38 and 42? Then there's a second part. I'll wait for you to answer the first part. <sighs> yeah, um, I don't know the specifics of what's going on there. Um, they're talking about PET coated tapes, um, which I, I actually don't understand what that means there, Jim. Um, you know, you can have a PET film um, that has some variability. Uh, I guess maybe they're talking about a film, uh, which doesn't have adhesive okay. on it. It's polyester. Yeah, so, um, and uh, they might be measuring uh, the dyne level on it. And I can tell you that um, we buy a lot of polyester film because it goes into a lot of our tapes. Um, it can vary in, in surface energy because of how the polyester film is manufactured. A lot of times, right, me, um, the manufacturers provide a coating to it um, that can affect the, uh, the surface energy. All right, let me give you the second part. There's, um, furthermore, if we corona treat this material, the dyne level will continue to drop. Our thoughts are silicone contamination, but unsure. Oh, that's interesting. Those, 
Um, yeah, yeah. It, it sounds like there might be some type of coding on that particular film um, because dying level ap- or excuse me, Corona treatment absolutely should bring up the, uh, the surface energy. So if there is some type of uh, treatment on there that's adversely working with the Corona treatment, that, that might be what's occurring there. Okay. Uh, next question. How much pressure is recommended at the bond line? Does that amount of pressure vary because of the substrate surface energy? Yeah, uh, generally um, we're recommending between 5 to 10 uh, PSI uh, upon application. Um, we definitely have a lot of parts that are, are hand bonded. Um, it's always best to have some type of jelly roller apply over the die cut. We know that sometimes that's not possible. Uh, if you have a, a process set up that's very sensitive to how much pressure you're able actually to apply, then generally speaking, you're going to want a more aggressive adhesive like our general purpose acrylic or general purpose rubber. Um, uh, we also know that like in automotive, for example, though, a lot of your customers have uh, these machines that are applying uh, pressure after it's hand applied. So let's just take, for example, an EPDM foam strip is being applied to a molded polypropylene plastic. Uh, the operator applies that strip on there. And what's great about some of these um, manufacturers is that they have these machines that the part goes into and there's a press that actually applies pressure uh, onto the adhesive to ensure a good bond. Um, but that range is usually around five PSI um, for a few seconds. Um, but obviously the more pressure and the longer the better. Um, just we, we, we have to be mindful of obviously you can't apply too much pressure or you might destroy the die cut. And then also, you know, we can't hold it on there forever because, you know, your customer's process needs to be fast and efficient. All right, and this is our, our last question. Uh, in a peel adhesion test, when does a PSA max out its peel strength? Yeah, so uh, the answer to that is um, a PSA will max out its peel strength when it cohesively splits, uh, meaning the adhesive layer will split in the middle. And um, as the, the, the laminate and the substrate are pulled apart, there's a layer of PSA remaining on both sides, okay? So that ensures that the adhesion of the, uh, the tape is maxed out on either side, and now you're measuring the, the internal strength of the adhesive, okay? Um, that's when that particular adhesive will max out its adhesion. Um, the, the thing you need to know about that, though, is that the cohesive strength of different adhesives uh, will have different uh, maxed out peel values, okay? So, for example, our FBR 1950, which was that general purpose rubber that you saw in our, our chart that had a lot of high peel values, um, was probably cohesively splitting at around eight pounds per inch. Um, but if you compare that to, uh, say, an HPA, and you were able to actually uh, achieve its highest bond strength, it would be much higher. Um, but the balance there is that the uh, adhesive strength uh, or the bond strength needs to be stronger than the internal strength of the adhesive. So ultimately it comes down to the cohesive strength of the, of the adhesive. All right, thank you, Scott. So once again, thank you for attending. Um, later today you will be receiving a post-event email and that email will be a feature story, know your end user substrate and a short survey. We really do appreciate your feedback in the survey, so please answer the questions. We want to continue to improve and evolve with the Core Series program. If you like a copy of today's presentation, please contact your account manager, and they can get that to you. Uh, we are going to have this recording on our website as well within a week, so it will be available there. But if you want a copy of the actual presentation, please um, contact your account manager. Um, as a reminder, our next Core Series webinar will take place on September 10th. They focus on step three of the heat selection process. Are there any end use requirements? So we look forward to you joining us on September 10th. Thank you again and have a good day.